Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we do rejoice in the peace that we have because of not only the fact that our ways are known, but you lay out our path, you lay out our steps, you know us and you have good purposes for us. And so that we can face anything, come what may, we know that you are for us. And if you are for us, who can be against us? Nobody. We glory in Christ our King the one who's been exalted at your right hand. He now is in a position of all authority. And he's there with the crown rights of the universal king and he's praying for his people. He's interceding for us. What a joy, what a privilege, what a blessing. And not only that, he has all authority. He's ruling, he's reigning. The, the world doesn't see it, but the eye of faith sees that he's on his throne guiding history to its intended purposes. And we rest in that. And God, we are thankful for new babies, thankful for Griffin Goldsmith, thankful for Emma Footer. I may be missing some. If I miss some, thankful for them. Know that there's many more coming, and we're so glad, so glad to have a fruitful church and to have a young church. And we do pray for Griffin and Emma that you would continue to be with them, that they would nurse well and rest well, and you'd be with their mamas and their daddies and and ultimately that you would grab their hearts and, and capture their affections at a very early age. I pray that this church will be a means to that end. God, we pray for Redeemer Church as they gather this morning on the north side of town, that you would be present by your spirit in their services and that you would exalt your son through the praying of the word and singing of the word and preaching of the word. God, I pray that you would give us favor in our witness here in the city of Abilene, in our homes and in our workplaces and in our places of leisure, would you give us favor and opportunities and just easy fruit? That's what we want. So we pray that you'd make it easy for us so that we might be encouraged in faithfulness. As we turn to your word, would you give us ears to hear, hearts to receive through Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you and the spirit, everyone God, amen. Well, today we live in what can be called a post-Christian society. Not that long ago, people in America, they basically viewed the world through the lenses that had been at least shaped and informed by the Bible. It's not to say that most Americans were Christians or anything like that, but their basic moral framework was shaped by the Judeo-Christian worldview. That's no longer the case. And I think to be effective in today's society, we have to begin thinking at the worldview level. Well, what do I mean by that? We need to do worldview evangelism and worldview discipleship and worldview parenting. A worldview, you can see it in the word, is simply a way of viewing the world. It's a way of looking at the world. All people have a way of looking at the world. They have a worldview. Every single person has certain assumptions and presuppositions about the world and humanity and its problems and solutions and where it's all headed. Our worldview is the grid through which we interpret reality. It's the lenses we wear which help us make sense of life. One philosopher named Albert Walters, he defines a worldview like this. He says it's the comprehensive framework of one's basic beliefs about things. And so again, every living person has one. It's simply part of being human, part of being made in God's image is we have this grid. We all have a set of convictions about how reality functions and how we should live. We all have a set of beliefs that explain what life is about and who we are and the most important things in life. Our worldview informs how we approach everything, all of life. Our view of the world affects our religion and our ethics and our education and parenting and politics, environmental concerns, health care, family, dress, entertainment, so much more. All people have some map by which to chart their course. And it's important to be thinking this way as we're confronted with different teaching and ideas and advertisements we ought to be asking what's their view of the world so just consider some slogans and headlines that we hear today YOLO you only live once well that's a certain worldview and it's a certain view of the future it's a certain view of the purpose of life what about this one all white people are racist just by virtue of being white well, it's a certain view of humanity and a certain view of the problems of humanity. It's known as cultural Marxism. It's a worldview. Now we're hearing that two plus two doesn't necessarily equal four all the time. 
Maybe you've heard this. I'm not real sure how to categorize that one, except <laughs> absurd. What about this one? I was born gay. I have no choice in the matter. Well, it's a certain view of biology and a certain view of personal responsibility and human sexuality. Or this one, I'm a product of my chemical balances and I'm not responsible for my emotions. Well, again, it's a certain view of humanity. It's that we're just biochemical machines without responsibility. Or how about this headline from last week? All kinds of things going on here. New Zealand man who identifies as a woman is able to compete in the 2021 Olympic weightlifting competition. I don't know if you saw, they interviewed the actual women, what they thought about this progress, and they didn't say a word. No thank you. They would rather not comment about such progress. It's a certain view of gender, a certain view of human identity. What about this one? Well, if you fall out of love, it's okay to get a divorce. Again, a a worldview about marriage and love. What about this one? Very popular. Well, whatever works for you is true. If it's true for you, it's true for you. What's true for me is true for me. It's a certain view of truth and knowledge known as relativism. It teaches that there are no absolutes in the world except for the absolute truth that there is no absolute truth. What about this one? Fetuses are just a clump of cells. Again, certain view of humanity, certain view of biology. Do we call it reproductive rights or murder? It depends on your worldview. If it feels good, do it. It's a view of the world known as hedonism. There is no purpose in life. Just get what you can while you can. You only live once. It's a view of the world. It's a worldview known as nihilism. What about this one? This one's popular today. Don't worry about facts. Trust your feelings. It's a worldview actually inherited from Jean-Jacques Rousseau. It's known as romanticism. It's important to know where these things come from. There's nothing new under the sun. What about this one? You can believe in God. That's fine. Do your thing. Just keep it to yourself. Keep it in your prayer closet. Don't try to bring that out in public. It's a certain view of the world known as secularism. We could go on and on and on. Just last week, the, the WebMD posted an article saying that the AMA, the American Medical Association, declared that one's sex should be removed from one's public, public birth certificates. Again, certain view of gender and humanity and identity and biology and even anatomy. These are all worldview issues. And so we need to gain skill in today's world at thinking at this level. If we're going to be effective at witness, if we're going to be effective culture shapers, we've got to think at this foundational worldview level. And this is true for all of us, but I'm especially concerned, especially burdened for the next generation. They are growing up in a world that if you're 40 and plus, it's entirely different than the world we grew up in. I'm not 40 yet, just for the record. (laughs) Getting close. But I'm burdened for the next generation. We've got to be training them, again, parenting and discipleship at this level because they're going to go and they're going to be exposed. They already are, even at the earliest ages, to all kinds of false ideologies. And we've got to equip them to think at this level, to be able to dissect and ask some of these foundational questions. And we ought to take the life of the mind seriously as Christians. Nathan already read one. One of the great commandments is to love God with, among other things, all of our minds. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10. It says, though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. This is the war everyone's in. I like the way the the New Living Translation, it's a bit of a a paraphrase, but I like the way they paraphrase this first. Let me read it to you. It says this, we're human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. So we take thoughts captive. Listen to the way Colossians 2.8 puts it. See to it, church, that no one takes you captive 
by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Again, listen to the way the paraphrase puts it. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. So you put these two together, 2 Corinthians 10 and Colossians 2, we're to take captive. We're not to be taken captive by these false ideologies, but instead we're to take them captive and make them obedient to Jesus. All right, that's all by way of introduction. This is going to be a little bit of a different sort of sermon. It's going to be a little bit of summary and overview of where we've been for the last four months, but also a little bit of worldview analysis. If you haven't been with us, we've been in the Sermon on the Mount. This will be the 17th sermon in the Sermon on the Mount. These three chapters, we've been here for a good long while, and at least for me, it's been really rich. I hope it's been encouraging to you, the greatest sermon ever preached. And when I, I want to approach it as we kind of wrap it up and move on in a way of just summarizing, but asking what kind of worldview does the Sermon on the Mount give us? You can answer that question maybe a little bit differently if we were using the whole Bible, but this morning we're just going to focus on Matthews 5, 6, and 7 and ask eight crucial questions. And these are eight crucial questions you ought to think through, be able to answer, but also ask others. Ask your kids, ask your unbelieving friends. Eight crucial questions about our view of the world. Number one, where did we come from? It's amazing to me how often use these in evangelism. It's amazing to me how often people don't actually think about it. I'll ask college-age kids in particular, it's typically who I ask, and they haven't thought through. Well, you know, I don't know. I was taught this, but I don't really know what I thought. Where did we come from? Well, again, we could go to Genesis and answer this more fully. How does the world answer this question? Well, the main alternative to Christianity today in terms of ideas is that of atheism or evolution. The idea that all there is is the material world, so the, the idea that life sprung somehow from non-life and now we live in this chance random universe. But what we learned so far and up to the Sermon on the Mount and from Matthew is that history is guided. There is in fact nothing random in God's world. History is his story. And he has guided his people. In the first four chapters of Matthew, we've seen again and again, Matthew's just banging this drum, showing us that this story that he's about to give us, this story of Jesus, is in fact the completion and culmination of the story of the Old Testament, which is why he says again and again and again something like we see in chapter 1, verse 22. All this took place to fulfill, he uses this word fulfill 12, 13 times to show that what is happening in the life of Jesus is completing and climaxing the story of Israel. We see it again in chapter 2, verse 15. This was to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Chapter 2, verse 17. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. Chapter 2, verse 23. Then what was fulfilled that what was written. We see it again and again and again that Jesus is the climax of the story of Scripture so far. And he includes anyone who trusts in him, makes anyone who has faith in him part of his family and therefore part of this story. Where did we come from? Well, we're grafted into the story. I was reading 1 Corinthians 10 recently and struck because it's speaking to the church of Corinth, which is Gentile. And he says, our forefathers, when he's speaking about the Exodus generation. So here he is writing to Gentiles saying, what happened back here? That's our forefathers if we've trusted in Christ. We're created by God and we're part of a story. That's where we came from. Number two, how can we know things? What's the nature of knowledge? If you're a philosophy student, we're talking about epistemology. How do we know what we know? What does the world say? Well, the world says we know what we know mostly through things we experience. It's our own experience that's the, the rule. It's the standard. Or maybe it's our own reason. Our reason is our authority. And so at the end of the day, the buck stops here. Not only how can we know anything, but also how can we know right and wrong? Well, again, what does the world say? Really good question to ask your friends. Where do you think right and wrong come from? What's the basis for right and wrong? Think about the world. What's the basis of right and wrong? It ends up being personal preference, personal opinion. At the end of the day, something's wrong because I don't like it. That's why. Sometimes people be a little more sophisticated and say that right and wrong is determined in communities, societies. And so societies, cultures come together and they then determine what's right and what's wrong. 
That doesn't work either, though, because personal opinions often clash, don't they? And societies often clash, don't they? What's right in one society can be evil in another society. So who's to say which is better? Well, mine's better because it's my opinion. Mine's better because it's my society. That doesn't work. We need something outside of us. We need an objective standard by which to measure right and wrong. Well, what does Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? Look at chapter 5, verse 17. He points to Scripture as the basis of all knowledge. Verse 17, do not think, Jesus says, that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. No one had a higher view of the Bible than Jesus. And then later on, Jesus says that his own words have the very same authority as the Bible. That's why in chapter 7, verse 24 from last week, Jesus said, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So how do we know things? Well, we don't creatively construct knowledge. No, we humbly receive knowledge from God's self-revelation in the Bible. That's how we know things. Ultimately, Scripture is the determiner. Third, what's wrong with the world? It's a really good question to ask your people who don't know the Lord. What do you think is wrong with the world? How do they answer this question? Well, again, in a host of ways, some say it's just lack of education. If we had more education, the world would work itself out. Some say the Republicans are the problem. Others say the Democrats are the problem. Some say it's our environment. Some say it's our genes. Some say it's our background. Some say it's our biology. One time a newspaper article was asking the question, what's wrong with the world? And they were just taking various letters to the editor and G.K. Chesterton, who was nothing if not witty, wrote in and said, dear sir, I am yours, GKC. Our problem, the problem that the world is sin. And Jesus mentions lots of different sins in this sermon. Remember anger and murder and strife and lust and divorce and dishonesty and retaliation and anxiety and wrongly judging others without first judging ourselves. Mentions all kinds of sin that we're all guilty of in various ways. We stand condemned. Sin and guilt, that's our fundamental problem. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus actually mentions another problem quite a bit that surprises at first, that of hypocrisy. The problem is not only that we do the wrong things. Jesus says sometimes the problem is that we do the right things with the wrong motive. We do the right things with an aim for our own glory and rather than God being glorified. That's why he has some harsh words for the religious leaders of his day. Look at chapter 6, verse 1. Beware, Jesus says, of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you'll have no reward from your Father who's in heaven. He says, watch out for being good people if your aim is to be seen as a good person. He says it many times. Look at verse 5. When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners. Here it is. Here's the motive. Here's the aim. That they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they've received their reward. Or look again at verse 16, chapter 6. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they've received their reward. Jesus rebukes the religious leaders, the ones who looked like the holiest people. He rebukes them. He says, you honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. Religiously zealous people who don't have a heart for God are part of the problem. Jesus has a higher calling than to just keep the rules, right? Look at chapter 5, verse 20. Remember what he said there? He says, I tell you, 
unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. If you remember that sermon, it wasn't that we need to be more externally rigorous. They were the most externally rigorous. The idea is they didn't have a heart righteousness. That was their problem. They did things on the outside, but their heart was far from God. And so Jesus says, if you're going to be part of my kingdom, you've got to have a heart for me. That's why he says at the very end of chapter 5, verse 48, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. He doesn't mean never sin. We're going to see that again and again. We already have. He's not saying being free from sin, but the idea is being whole. Yes, doing things outwardly, but having a heart for him as well, being unified wholehearted dedication to God and all of life in in orientation toward God, not compartmentalizing our lives. So what's the problem with the universe? It's that we're guilty and that our hearts are sick, sinful, broken. Prophet Jeremiah says this, human heart, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Isn't that the opposite of what the world says? The world says, follow your hearts. God says, there's nothing more deceitful than the human heart. <laughs> That's our problem. Our problem isn't a lack of education. Our problem isn't a lack of resources. The problem isn't even that we necessarily just do the wrong things. Jesus says the problem's deeper than that. We are radically depraved. Radix from, from Latin meaning roots. From the heart broken, sinful sick we need new hearts that's the problem with the world what's the solution again ask your friends this what's the solution how does the world answer this question again lots of solutions are offered up some say well like I said need education that'll fix it all more money more resources some say the right person in office will be fine some just say love just love. Love is love, which nowadays really means nothing. Something that defined, what do you mean by love? Today, love just means affirming people wherever they are, just affirm them. Even if it leads to depression in this life and destruction in the next. Jesus disagrees. What's the solution to the problem of humanity? What solution does Jesus offer? Notice the way this gospel started. Flip back to Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. How does he kick this book off? Notice the way he introduces Jesus. She will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus comes, lives a perfect life, dies on the cross in our place, condemned he stood. He takes care of both of our problems. He takes care of our guilt. And he takes care of our sinful hearts. He does both. In other words, he brings what this whole gospel is going to at the end of the chapter. He brings the new covenant. Remember what Jeremiah promised? I'll fully forgive your sins and I'll write the law on your heart. That was the problem with the people of God before. The way Ezekiel puts it, he'll take out that, that stony heart that doesn't respond to God and he'll replace it with a heart of flesh that does. He'll fix our fundamental problem, which is our sin and our sick hearts. That's what he comes to do. We can have new hearts for God, not just that external rule keeping like the Pharisees. Now we have this heart righteousness that surpasses theirs. And remember in the heart, it's our our whole self, right? The Bible teaches that the heart is human life in its totality. It's this big term. It's not just this organ and it's not just our feelings, but it's, it's the central animating center of all we do. The heart in the Bible is the motivational headquarters. It defines us and it directs us. And so now we've been freed and now we're able to follow God, always imperfectly, but now we've been renewed. And so we don't murder, chapter 5, verse 21. But we don't even get angry either. We fight murder, yes, but we also fight anger. 21 says, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who's angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. We not only avoid adultery, absolutely we avoid adultery. But now we seek purity of hearts internally. Chapter 5, verse 27. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his hearts. Now we're those that are 
pure in heart. Chapter 5, verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Jesus and Jesus alone brings the solution to the world's problem. And by the way, church, just zoom out a minute. We have the solution to the fundamental problem of the world. We have it. God has entrusted it to us, which is why the Bible calls us stewards. I love this verse from 1 Corinthians 4. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. We know, we alone in the church know what the fundamental problem of the world is and we alone have been entrusted with the only solution to the world and God has entrusted us with it as stewards. We are to be faithful to it, not to change it, but we're not faithful if we're not getting it out. Faithful stewards, get the thing going. The gospel came to you because it needs to go to somebody else. We're stewards of this solution. And again, these are great questions to ask your friends, to get them thinking, to put a little pebble in their shoe and leave them with just a thoughtful, provocative question. Where do you think the world came from? Oh yeah, why do you think that? What do you think's wrong? Why is, I mean, turn on the news. What is going on? Seem like we have figured it out by now, right? What do you think's the solution? Where do you get that idea? Is there any purpose in life? Like, what are you really living for? Have you ever zoomed out? Like, yeah, you're working here. You got this paycheck, whatever. But at the end of the day, is there any deeper meaning in your life? What does the future hold? Is there anything to hope for beyond this life? What makes you say that? What's your basis for saying that? Ask them about their view of the world. And then share how the gospel informs yours. Question five, what's the purpose of life? What is the purpose of life? One of the biggest questions we can ask. How does the world answer this question? Some say, well, just get while the getting's good. He who dies with the most toys wins. Hedonism. Just live for comfort, live for pleasure. More consistent atheists, though, will say, actually, there is no purpose. And if evolution is true, there is no purpose. It's just strong, eat the weak, dominate, spread your seed as much as you can because the universe is just a chance random place with no afterlife, nothing. It's all had to do an end, darkness. No real transcendent purpose, just eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die. And what does the Sermon on the Mount say about the purpose of life? gives two main answers to be happy and to glorify God you say well isn't that what the world says the world says just be happy well true Augustine said every man whatsoever his condition desires to be happy Blaise Pascal said all men seek happiness this is without exception whatever different means they employ they all tend to this end but Jesus does teach us to be happy it's just happy in God happy the way he defines it in other words true happiness remember the Beatitudes how they start in chapter 5 verse 3 way back in our first sermon on the Sermon on the Mount back in March I talked about this word blessed Matthew 5 3 blessed Matthew 5 4 blessed Matthew 5 5 blessed in some ways it's one of the most important words in the whole sermon it's determinative for the rest of the sermon and what does the word mean well it just means happy it's what the word means there were some early biblical manuscripts, and in the title here, our title says the Sermon on the Mount, but there are several manuscripts early on where the title of this sermon was Concerning Happiness. That's what J Jesus is laying out for us. The Beatitudes here begin the sermon in their descriptions and commendations of the good life. This word for blessed. It's the same word in Psalm 1, so it opens the whole book of Psalms as well. Blessed is the one who, what, avoids wickedness, delights in the law of the Lord. It's like a tree planted by streams of water, flourishes. The purpose of life is to flourish. But the only way to flourish is by being wise. And wisdom consists in following the Lord. So be happy and glorify God. Look at Matthew 5, verse 16. Jesus says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven, that they might glorify the Father. Look over very famously, first line of the Lord's Prayer in chapter 6, verse 9. How does the prayer start? 
Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. May your name be honored. May your name be set apart by the way we live. We're to glorify God and we're to help others glorify God. Our aim should be to please him in all we do. It's why we exist, to see his name hallowed, to see his name exalted in all things. And in God's kindness, these two purposes go together. As we seek happiness in him, we more faithfully bring honor to him. They're not at odds. They go together. Here's how John Piper famously puts it in his book, Desiring God. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. The more we enjoy living for him, the more glory he receives. Here's how the Westminster Shorter Catechism opens question one. What's the chief end? There's our question, right? What's the purpose in life? What's the chief end of man? Can't improve on it. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. So there is purpose in life. And in God's kindness, what he calls you to is actually the most satisfying. There's a higher purpose. There's a transcendent meaning. And as we pursue that, we flourish. You know why? Because when we pursue his will, we're doing what he created us to do. And when we do what we're created to do, we flourish. Question six, what time is it? What time is it? In other words, where are we at in history? How does the world answer this question? Well, most would say nowhere. We're just barreling down the hall of history. But the Sermon on the Mount teaches that we're living in a unique time. Starting in the first coming of Jesus, we're living in the time of fulfillment. Jesus teaches that all of God's promises are coming to to pass in him. He says that the kingdom has come. That's what John the Baptist comes preaching in chapter 3, verse 2. Repent, change your mind, drop your agenda. Why? Because the kingdom of God is here. That's what he says. Jesus says in the very next chapter, chapter 4, verse 17, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is dawning in the first coming of Jesus. Chapter 5, verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So history is filled with meaning. And God's taking it somewhere. He made promises and he's bringing those promises to pass. The kingdom is here and it's expanding and growing and eventually will be fully accomplished. That's why we pray, right? Chapter 6, verse 10. What do we pray in the Lord's Prayer? Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we're in a unique time where God is making good on his promises. And so we're called then to be a part of it. We're called to be fruitful and multiply and make disciples and rule and reign on God's behalf to bring the rule of Jesus to bear on all of life. Make babies, make culture. Seventh question then, where is the world headed? What does the future hold? How does the world answer this question? Well, there's really two main visions. We see them in our movies, right? It's either utopia, everything's going to get awesome, or it's dystopia, and everything's going to fall apart. But either way, after you die, that's it. No more. There's really no hope. Nothing beyond this life. Well, what does Jesus teach about the future? Look at chapter 5, verse 5. Blessed, happy, flourishing are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Jesus, along with the prophets and the apostles, taught that this world will be redeemed. A little bit later in this gospel, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, Jesus is going to speak of the new world, the renewal of all things. Those who trust in Christ will reign with Christ on a renewed earth forever and ever. God is going to make all things right. Our life, this little life, all 90 years of it, if the Lord wills, is just a blip on the radar. Just a speck in light of eternity. Just the beginning for us. Death is not a period. It's just a comma. We have all kinds of hope. The world has none. Eighth question, probably most important for the Sermon on the Mount, it's where we've been. How then shall we live? How does the world answer this question? Well, it's you do you. Whatever works for you, you should do. Whatever 
makes you happy, you should do. Follow your heart. Basically, it's to live a self-focused life. And that's in the worldview of atheism. It's all about self-preservation at the end of the day. Self-focused. Where the call of the kingdom is the exact opposite, is to give of self. That's where true joy is found. It's to be these people that embody these beatitudes, right? Those that are poor in spirits because we know of our sin. We mourn over our sin. We're meek. We hunger and thirst for righteousness. We're merciful. We're pure in heart. We're peacemakers. When we're persecuted for the sake of the king, we rejoice. So as we live like this, we're going to be different, aren't we? We're going to be contrast society. We're going to be a countercultural people, which is why he uses the imagery he does in chapter 5, verse 13. You're the salt of the earth. Salt, if anything, is distinct. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You're the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. How are we to live? We're a people under authority. We're not our own authority. We're under King Jesus who wields his scepter through his word. We're ruled by him. We saw, look with me at chapter 5. Let's just walk through it. Chapter 5, verse 21. We're those who are not okay with anger. We fight anger. We're those who pursue reconciliation, even take initiative to do so. Verse 27, we're not those who pursue our lusts, but crucify them. Verse 31. We value marriage and we do all we can to stay married, even when the going gets tough. Look at chapter 5, verse 32. I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. We tell the truth. Look at 537. Let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. We resist retaliation. We love our enemies. Look at chapter 5, verse 43. You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Chapter 6, we give to the needy. We pray to the Father. We fast in secret. We know our weaknesses, we know our frailness, we know our dependence, and so we're a people of prayer. Look at chapter 6, verse 11. We ask regularly, give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our debts as we've also forgiven our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We're a forgiven people, so we forgive people. There are no grudges, no bitterness, no vengeance in this community. Contrary to the American dream, we're not materialists. We're not laying up treasures here, but we are generous and cheerful and sacrificial. Look at chapter 6, verse 19. In our giving, Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We're not okay with being anxious, verse 25, but we fight it. We realize we're responsible and we're able to overcome sinful emotions. We do trust. We trust our heavenly father. Look at verse 31, chapter six. Therefore, do not be anxious, Jesus says, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles, the pagans, they seek after all these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them all, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. We judge ourselves first. We have a humility about us before we judge others. Look at chapter 7, verse 1. Most quoted Bible verse today. It used to be John three sixteen. Now it's Matthew 7, 1. Judge not that you not be judged, but we got to keep reading. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye? But don't notice the log that's in your own eye. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye when there's a log in your eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. We judge ourselves before we go about judging others, but we're called to do both. 
judge ourselves first. We're a people of self-giving love, right? We embody the golden rule, chapter 7, verse 12. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the whole law and the prophets. And as Jesus just pounds home, paragraph after paragraph after paragraph at the end of this sermon, we're those on the narrow road, not the broad road. We bear good fruit, not bad fruit. We don't merely say, Lord, Lord, but we do the will of the Father. We don't merely hear the words of Jesus. We seek to obey them. So where do we come from? God created us and he includes us in his story. How can we know things? The word of God. What's wrong with the world? We have sick and sinful hearts. What's the solution? The new covenant Jesus brings. No guilt and inward transformation. What's the purpose of life? To be happy in God, the blessed life. What time is it? The kingdom of God has taken over the world. Where's the world headed? New heavens, new earth. How then shall we live? For his glory, which is our good. Let's pray together. Father, how kind of you that you are there and you're not silent and you lay all this out for us. And we've all been grabbed by the grace of the Spirit to believe in Jesus. And it's so encouraging as we now reflect on it critically that the Christian faith is so satisfying experientially, but also intellectually. Your word gives us foundations that no other view of the world can. It gives us a consistency that no other world view can. And so we're grateful. Thank you for your word and its comprehensiveness and how it shows us how compelling Jesus is. And it shows us at the end of the day that every other view of the world is either absurd or just flat bankrupt. I pray that we would be a people that's consistent with all this and give us an urgency. You've stewarded all this to us. You've given us all this as a treasure in jars of clay and pray that even this week we would be good stewards and we would ask good questions and we would ultimately be able to share Jesus with those we love. Be honored now in our praise. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.